afraid. Well, there you go. I mean, I think that's quite nice. Although I'm no good on a boat. What we did do um, last year is we went on those, um, what do you call them? Skidoo. Not a skidoo. Well, um, you know, the pedalo. No, they're like, they're, they're like motorbikes <laughs> Jet on ski. water. Jet, Jet ski. ski. <laughs> Not a skidoo. That's on the snow. A motorbike on the water. <laughs> um, I'll tell you what, it was terrifying to begin with because you really bounced yeah. up and down. Loving loved it, though. I can imagine the adrenaline rush. Oh, it was great. I wasn't driving, actually. I was clinging on to the back. Oh, gosh, yes. Um, but that was all right. It was, it was in the med. I mean, it was lovely and warm oh, wow. and gorgeous. I was a bit scared of one because I once went on the back with my dad as a kid and he uh, decided to take a big turn and I fell off the back. Oh. And, um, yeah, got a bit sore. So now I'm not so keen. Oh, yeah. No, I enjoyed it. Not that it. I have the opportunity that much. Mind <laughs> you, it was, actually, it was, a, it was a few years ago now. It wasn't last year. It was a few years ago and I enjoyed it so much. I, married, I agreed to marry him the same day. Oh. Well, that would be Aww. exciting. So there you go. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Like a nice, strong yeah. man. Love is yeah. in the air. Ah, da, 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 <laughs> da, da, da. Um, Fraser, the Prime Minister reckons he's going to take on Keir Starmer over net zero. Yeah, I mean, you know, the context, obviously, is that Rishi is massively, massively behind in the polls um, <laughs> <laughs> behind Keir Starmer, but he's thinking that, you know, the sort of uh, mild differences that he's proposing in how to handle net zero could be a possible uh, dividing line between um, Labour and the Tories. I mean, Labour has already come out to defend the previous um, ban on petrol cars coming in in 2030. They say they restore that when, um, you know, if they get into power. Uh, I think this is a good area for the Prime Minister to exploit, but I don't think he's gone anywhere near far enough. I think that a lot of people won't necessarily be grateful um, for him pushing back targets that haven't yet affected them yet. I think, you know, mm. people want to see... People are struggling with the cost of living right now. Not They're not necessarily thinking about 2030. Um, so, you know, there are... Basically, there are lots of green levies on um, electricity. There are all, all kinds of other areas that he could be looking at um, in terms of, you know... Yeah, but, uh, that, but, that, but, that... but that's the key, isn't it? It, mm. it looks like he's doing something mm. significant, but it doesn't cost him anything. That's true, because... And, and also, he, you know, he's not going to be Prime Minister by 2030 or 2035. Uh, no. You know, let's let's you be never honest, know. it's not... <laughs> it well. puts on... The other thing is that it puts pressure... And this is what I think is quite clever hmm. from Richard Sunak. It puts pressure on Keir Starmer to, act, to actually start talking... Yeah. ..and yes. setting out what he thinks. OK, so you wouldn't delay the ban on petrol and diesel cars. Explain why. And, and I think you it's know? a really positive thing, especially when it comes to, you know, kind of green issues, because there has been a cross-party consensus on this for, you know, at least the past 20 years. There hasn't been any difference between uh, Labour and Tory. You know, everyone signed up to the Climate Change Act. I mean, the or net zero itself was passed without a vote, um, with about 90 minutes of debate in Parliament, even though it's probably the most significant government policy of our lifetime, possibly, you know, in, of the past few hundred years. But it is important, isn't it? I mean, the, the problem is we get wound up by all the debate and, the, uh, and, you know, and the costs and all the rest of it. The idea of actually going net zero, not having a carbon footprint, but whether you believe carbon is causing uh, global warming or not, it's still an important thing to do, isn't it? Well, I just want to see clear dividing lines. I want to actually have a choice. As from the perspective as a voter, at the next election, I want them to have distinct positions that I can compare against. And I think that it's good that Keir Starmer, he's being pressured into being a bit more consistent because I think he's been a bit vague, a bit wishy-washy. I don't think he's really pinned himself down on anything. But if the Conservatives take strong positions and then he can take a strong position, I think that actually makes the political debate Debate much better. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. I want to see way more pluralism in our political debate. But, the, but this is the this is the basic problem, yeah. isn't it? Actually, they're fighting for the centre ground because that's how you win an election. And so they're not that far apart. Mm. Yeah, well, that's true, actually. And I think that with what Rishi, Rishi Sunak is doing, it is only tweaks. But still, I do think it is important that you have pragmatic voices sort of checking what I think has been the domination of more apocalyptic voices. And, I mean, you were saying, yes, it's very rational to want to um, tackle climate change and to find ways of doing it. But I do feel the people who've dominated that debate, they don't talk about things in terms of policy and in an optimistic no. way. Well, and I have an issue with no, that. It's, it's all you've destroyed our future. Yes. Also, yes. I'm so fed yeah. up of 
hearing Labour representatives and Lib Dem representatives talking about how they'll do all these net zero policies, they'll insulate millions of homes, they'll switch out everyone's boilers to heat pumps, all of this, and there's no costing, absolutely no costing. And, you know, Philip Hammond, he wrote a letter a few years ago saying it's going to cost one to two trillion pounds. Haven't heard anything about the cost since. No. You know? well, well, my... We need a bit of honesty about it and then we can actually make a decision. I, I well, that's right. The, the scale of the challenge has not really been talked about in politics. And Rishi was right to, talk, to say, you know, there's been dishonesty about this. I mean, it does involve changing just about every area of our life and industry. Mm. It's an enormous undertaking. That's not necessarily an argument against it, but you want to hear that people that the practical challenges have actually been considered. All right, well, the, let's the look other at... side of it is that you know it's often talked about. It's just we just will adopt new technologies. Actually, um, the Climate Change Committee, which you know looks at these things, say that 62% will have to come from um, personal and individual behaviour change, and right. so that is things like eating less meat driving less, going on holiday less. It, it, it involves doing things less as well as just switching um, over to new technologies. Well, we, well, That's we have, a big political We problem. have got some costings in the Sunday Times, Candice. Um, uh, updating the grid yes, yeah. to accommodate offshore winds, mm. £54 billion... Pounds just for the wiring. Yes, well, this is so. This is Robert Colville, so he's written an opinion piece, always worth reading, he's brilliant. And he's saying that one of the big problems we have is, you know, we're focusing so much on electrification and net zero, but we aren't building extra grid capacity. I mean, these very, very practical considerations. It, well... I mean, he was saying in the piece that many, many councils have signed up to the idea of climate emergency, that there is a climate emergency. They're not building charging points. Mm. And that is the big problem. I mean, that, you know, so much of it is um, dominated by rhetoric, but the actual practical getting down to business stuff, which is building extra capacity or, for instance, costing, isn't happening. But I'm thinking that is starting to come into the debate a lot more now. Mm. I mean, people have been so critical of, like, Nick Clegg, for instance, who for years, years ago opposed building... Um, more nuclear power stations. Mm. If we had those, we would have that extra grid capacity. I mean, there are so many challenges. I mean, the gas, in, gas infrastructure, that will cost billions yes. to change if we want mm. to adapt Loads. it to other... You know. Well, but that's, that's the other, other issue. With, that's the other issue with this. I mean, when you go back to the cars, and it's all about... Effectively, people are saying there's going to have to be electric vehicles which obviously there's all the controversy over how the batteries are built and, and the amount of carbon used in, in producing the batteries. A lot of people are saying, well, hydrogen, hydrogen fuel cells are better. Yes. But that technology isn't sort of being allowed to grow in the same way. So it's just, it, it, there's not enough plurality in the thinking. Yeah, we need to broaden it completely. I think that is happening. I think that's, <clears throat> that's happening in a way that's never quite happened before. I think when people were challenged in this, were, were the challenges in this debate were often dismissed as deniers. But mm. I think that's happening less and less now. Mm. And there is this sort of rational opposition, which I think is good. It's important. Mm. Yeah, the, the debate or the discussion has been very much happening at a sort of elite level. Um, you know, there hasn't been much contest, you know, much contestation. And the more we talk about it, the more sort of, you know, democracy is always a good thing, right? Because you sort of see the flaws in certain ideas and you come up with uh, better ideas. I think, you know, that's why the debate needs to happen. Otherwise, we will just, you know, be going out down this road uh, seemingly and, and making some really, you know, dangerous mistakes. I'm so sceptical. Well, not about everything, but about electric, uh, about electric vehicles. Are you why? Just because the government seems so behind them and they're listening to, you know, car manufacturers who obviously now have an interest to invest in electric vehicles because of all of these targets and everything. Wait. What if there's a better option? What, than electric? Through? Yeah. Especially with the you know, and everyone's bought them and we've upgraded our electricity system and then actually... You know, there's something else that could be better that we well, could it, well, it, in. Yeah, well, it is the hydrogen hydrogen thing, isn't it? Yeah. Where you just go... I mean, you can fill a hydrogen fuel... It takes about five minutes to fill a hydrogen yeah. fuel should cell. We, should we be putting our eggs in one basket, you know? Mm. That's what, all I'm saying. But yeah. that's the problem with government picking winners. Yeah, exactly. Rather than letting, you know, market, market mechanisms... Yeah, yeah, market mechanisms, which are highly efficient at doing that. Yeah, I have to, I have to say... I mean, I'm not, I'm not against electric vehicles at all. I'd quite like an electric mm. vehicle. I just need the battery 
capacity to be better. Yes. But it's always been the argument, well, if you have an electric vehicle, well, the electricity's got to be generated somewhere, well, exactly. somehow, and at the minute it's through coal or gas. Yes. Well, yeah. the, yes. I mean, the whole discussion needs to become a lot more sophisticated rather than just finger-pointing at each other, climate change denier. No, we actually really need to talk about the practical implications of this and what it will mean for people's lives. Well, so we need to know how to interact, and Julie Birchill, Candice, <laughs> says, because of lockdown, we don't know how to interact with each other <laughs> Well, yeah, so she's making making the argument in the, in the Mail on Sunday that the, the rise in shoplifting and what she's observed, right. it's not just, um, you know, that people, like many people say, it's the cost of living, but she thinks that people have forgotten how to behave. She's seen a rise in antisocial behaviour. And you, you've, she might be wrong, she might be right, but I want to understand what is at the heart of this now. You know, is it organised gangs organising all this shoplifting? So is or is it, it ordinary people? Yeah, well, that... And it's an important distinction, actually, because it's either... If it's... If it's shoplifting, it's ordinary people. The organised gang, some of the videos you have, it's looting, basically. Yeah, and I think, um, basically, you know, the message has uh, been received from criminals. I think it is a lot of gangs, actually, um, that if, if you steal uh, less than £200, then the police aren't interested in yeah. going after you. So that just sort of... It's been quasi-legalised, essentially, unfortunately, and so it has exploded... Um, over the past couple of years. Um, and, and you can also tell that it's not, you know, the story... Often people will tell stories about, you know, the desperate parent stealing um, for their child. And, you know, because you see things like formula milk being stolen. But actually, that has value because it has resale value, it doesn't go off. So there's certain products like formula milk, like Calpol, which sounds like they should pull on the heartstrings, but really they are being, you know, sold elsewhere for a yeah. profit. I mean, it's pretty depressing to see security tags on items like cheese, uh, which there? you do sometimes now see in some supermarkets. Security tags on items that, you know, or wouldn't have been, a, or, wouldn't have been yeah. a threat of being nicked before. Or um, Lurpak. They had security oh, really? tags on them in some Tesco's or Sainsbury's or well, whatever. Well, they are very expensive. They now. are very expensive. Really? I think they've come down a bit, though. Oh, right, there you go. I've gone back to margarine <laughs> spread, cos it's cheaper. Uh, we've got to leave it there. It's been a really good to see you both this morning. Candice, Fraser, thanks very much Thank indeed. You. Let's see what the weather's going to do.